start <coughs> with giving you a little back, bit of background about City Fibre. So we are predominantly a fibre network builder in the UK. Um, started around about seven years ago, so we're in build phase. So we're fundamentally different to many of the people in the room. Uh, we're an open access provider, and that's our commitment as a business. And we have, we have a view of infrastructure investment over the next 10 and 20 years. So some of the constraints that you may, you may operate on as a mobile operator or a residential operator for service provider services, where you're looking at the cash flow on a year by year basis, we're in the infrastructure build business at the moment. And, and that's, uh, you have to view what I'm gonna tell you within that perspective. So how do we look at networks? So as we look at every city, there is something that underwrites um, the business, which is something called a well-planned city. And a well-planned city for us is where we take all of the requirements of all the business sectors, all the public sector, the mobile community, as well as the FTTH, the residential service providers. Um, and this is, this is part of our DNA, this is how we work. And in doing so, we will be building the cities that we work in over a period of three, five, seven years to become fully integrated fibre meshes. We work with councils, we work with ISPs, and we work with the mobile community to phase that. And we may do it in some cases, in some cities we'll do it all at once, in some cities we'll do it over, as I said, a period of seven years. And we're just going to look at a couple of those. So these are three cities in the United Kingdom. And they all had different backgrounds to them. The first one is Milton Keynes. It, it was built in the 1950s, 60s. It's actually very much like a US grid city. And we actually had our first network in Milton Keynes through an acquisition. And when we look at acquisitions, we looked fundamentally at duct assets. And we went to the market in Milton Keynes using the duct as assets that we had acquired, predominantly to sell to the business community and a little bit of PSM, but primarily the business community. And then as we expand out that asset, we would build it alongside a view of all the things that are coming in that city. So whereas we may go down one road and we go, normally we'd put a 110 duct in. In a full planned, well planned city design, we would do two or three ducts. So our capital investment would be focused on that approach. We're using anchors to do that build. And in the end state, we're actually building Milton Keynes out now to a full fibre city. It's around about 85, 90,000 premises. A premise to us is any premise, fibre to home, mobile station, macro station. And that's in build, it's probably about 65% of the way through, probably clear in another two years. Then we looked at Aberdeen. Aberdeen we built from scratch. We had a partner in a local service provider who wanted to provide um, differential business services uh, in that market, it's a big oil town. So there's, there's a lot of premium business services that you can, you can deliver. And so we looked at Aberdeen, um, it's a complex build. It's, uh, in the UK you have a lots of different terrains. There's a lot of granite in Aberdeen, um, difficult to dig through in places. But we look at that city and we go, right, over the next three, five, seven, even 10 years, we're gonna make it look like a well-planned city. And so we built around about 200 kilometers, I think it was, in the first phase of that customer. And now, as part of our FTTH rollout, we're infilling that. Edinburgh, population, sorry, premises, is around about 250,000, so it's a nice sized city. Again, on granite, we seem to pick them. Um, and granite, uh, sorry, and uh, Edinburgh was, was based on public sector networks, business networks, um, and some of those public sector networks included large residential builds. Now, at, the point, at this point, I've not talked about the mobile networks. And that's because uh, as we do these well-planned cities, if we, if we look at the sequencing, we look back two, three years ago, and the best clarifications we can get from mobile operators in the UK is around macro cell locations. And we put them into these designs. We put them in as premise locations. But also working with the councils, we put all of the traffic cameras, the street lights and poles that may need connectivity over time. So all of them are into the aggregation of premises based on the information that we had at the time. And that's one of the dilemmas I'm going to walk you through in a moment. So how does that link in with 5G? 
We're working with the mobile operators. Um, there are four, four main mobile operators in the United Kingdom. We predominantly work with three of them. It's very clear that they all like their own network architectures. Everyone is unique. Everyone has business reasons for a slewing one way or another. Uh, and this is the city of Coventry. Coventry is approximately 150,000 premises as a city. Um, so it's a relatively large conurbation. It has multiple rail routes through it. It has distributed residential areas, business areas, a central business district. And in the United Kingdom, the mobile operators all have different market segments that they address. On top of that, they have fundamentally different spectrums. So when we were doing a set of macro cell analysis with them, yeah, we've got the list of the macro cells they have now. And then we started working with them to try and understand where their densification would occur. So as we look at these pictures, what do we have? Well, on the left-hand side, we have um, a 900 megahertz grid. And the operators who are around about that space are very, very much focused on the residential market. Um, and therefore, they're not so worried about people moving around, um, moving in their cars, etc. They care about people using mobiles at home. They're not doing so much Wi-Fi offload, etc. And as such, their areas for their macro cell densification is fundamentally different from what we see on the right-hand side with someone who is much more orientated around business services. Now, as we look at that, we can build anything because we're building the whole city. But inherently, this level of, of knowledge about how you're building your network and the market conditions that you're trying to address feeds through into the small cell densification. And we'll go back to that one in a moment. So what do we do? Well, we know where most of the macro cells are now. They're generally publicly available in the United Kingdom, um, and we have any infills or any plans, tactical plans, supplied to us by the mobile operators. And what do we do here? Uh, unfortunately, it's not come out too well, but on these slides on the left-hand side, what do we have? The blue lines are our core network. So we, ba we build our core network on rings. And why do we do that? We do it because inherently we think if we jump 10 years from now or 20 years from now, if we just did a traditional tree and branch network solution, we'd have to keep on closing it. We'd have to start building rings. If we look at the applications in the future, the importance of the networks that we're all building for business services, for mobile services, they require a degree, much greater degree of resilience in the core. So that's a default build type for us. And those blue lines represent that. Each blue line um, is, is part of this core network, multi-ducted, and will have um, residential areas of approximately 400, 480 premises hanging off them. And that's when we go into branch architectures. Now, we're in design, so we can move those blue lines. And we do move those blue lines. If a public sector um, contract comes up and they particularly wish us to enable a certain part of the city because they know they're going to build 10,000 houses there in five or seven years' time, we move the lines and then we construct. It's a long-term view. In addition, we work with the mobile operators and they tell us where these macro cells are going to go. And then we come to a dilemma. And the dilemma is more commercial than it is architectural. And it's every macro provider would love to have diversity to every macro site. Yet, if we do the calculations for just a few amount of sites, relatively about 50% um, percent approximately within the first 50 meters. So that's relatively easy to do. We can link off the core and we can connect those sites. But from that point onwards, it gets increasingly expensive to do diversity to the macro cells. Because it turns out the macro cells are not actually in all the locations where the residences are and where all the premises are. So there are infill dilemmas that we have to work through. A lot of it is, is commercial in the end. So to where do we end up? It ends up being an art of a compromise. We go through each city, 
we look at each macro cell. And we have to make, with the mobile operators, a set of compromises. So we, we often see, if you remember that picture where I showed you the densification plans, there's one operator who loves to be in business parks. And business parks in the United Kingdom are privately held generally, so you have to have way leaves to go across them. And actually digging across them is quite challenging at times. Many of the business parks are a lot of concrete, uh, almost as difficult as granite. And what we find is actually when you do the analysis of the build, doing diversity through a business park for 50 or 75 meters, it's just not worth the effort because you don't actually add any material level of diversity. In addition, we've got many sites on hospital roofs. Why? Because lots of people are in the hospitals using their mobile phones. But once you come onto the hospital grounds, it's incredibly controlled. You're unlikely to be allowed to do any work. So again, you might do diverse fiber, but on a single route. Um, and that's how you access those sites. Now then we move on to the public highway. And we have something called co-powers in the United Kingdom, and that gives us the rights to do a wide variety of things um, for accessing sites. So in the public highway, we can absolutely go diverse to multiple sites. Um, what we tend to find is when we drill down into the pictures of where these macro cells are, they're on the side of a building. And the building landlord who owns that building will only give you one route into the building. So you reduce your level of diversity risk, um, but yet fundamentally it still exists. So we go through all of these analysis with our, with our mobile providers to try and work out what the optimum design is along, in the long run. In addition, they have to look at their networks and see if they can overlap sites. So let's take that forward. And we take it forward to, sm forward to small cell densification. Now, we're doing a lot of trials for small cell densification in the United Kingdom. Um, we've done one in London over the last three years, uh, where, where um, I think the conclusion, it was fair to say, well, this was fibre-led, fibre for everything. Um, and, and when you exceed 400-odd fibres to a cabinet for individual services, it, it gets a little bit challenging. And at least everyone now acknowledges that. Um, uh, and also, we're working on a number of uh, trials with partners addressing that particular segment who are independent of the mobile operators. And this is, this is an example of a route in the same city that we were looking at a moment ago. And the operator here wants to address mobile comms for um, people going to work. Fundamentally, this is an incredibly busy road. Um, it's uh, very congested, slow moving relatively, um, off a business park. But if I look at this from our infrastructure investment perspective, there's relatively little additional benefit. There's access into the business park, which absolutely we will do, but there's very little residential network of it. And, and that dilemma comes to the fore again, which is if we're moving to small, small, small cell densification, then what is the income stream? How much value are we going to extract from that even over a 10 and 20 year lifetime to justify a fibre to every small cell? Especially when there's very little um, additional revenue coming from other sources. And we have to have that, that view. We don't see this small cell densification to this level in the residential space. So how does it come together? Well, not only do we provide fiber services, we provide active services as well. And I think it's fair to say that at the moment we have to poke the market for small cell densification. We are committed on the macro cells to provide dark fiber. That's something that we absolutely will support the mobile operators on. And to be fair, if the commercial terms are right, we would probably do small cell fiber everywhere. But at the moment, it's not trending that direction. And as such, we then need to look at a range of active style products, so bitstream style products, that we can deliver to uh, the, operator, the mobile operator community to enable them to aggregate their traffic together from the small cells. And there's a couple of ways that we're proposing to do that. First of all, we dedicate um, 
in each primary node, that 400 uh, premise area, 400, 408 premise area, we dedicate a one to eight splitter. And we dedicate it in the primary node, which is our first point of split in the network where it connects onto our ring-based architecture. And they can pick it up from an ONT. Um, and that ONT could be a Jeep on ONT for basic services if they want to get that to work within their current architecture. Um, or it could be an NG on 2 because that one to eight splitter for us rotates back into our own micro edge data centers, a city fiber fiber exchange we're calling them, where we have uh, the coexistence elements and we split off Jeep on services and NG on 2 services. We often have a debate about whether we would do XGS PON for these type of business services, but at the moment we reserve XGS PON in the long term for residential service growth. And we don't see putting residential services on NG PON 2 for us. Now, if there comes a time in the future whereby that small cell has to grow or is growing in its capacity and requires moving to direct fiber, then what we would do is we would just unsplice that position in the one to eight splitter and we splice it directly through to wherever it wants to go. It could go to our fiber exchange, but in the way we design the network, one of the things that again is, is core to how we work is just because I need my aggregated services, my ethernet services, my pond services to be aggregated in our fiber exchanges, doesn't mean I'm gonna force you as a mobile operator to come to my location. So our ring-based architecture through the city also allows us to hand off in a number of other locations, be they independent neutral data centers, be they the mobile operators existing sites, core sites, etc., or be they BT exchanges, so BT open reach exchanges, which is the incumbent operator in the United Kingdom. So any of those options are available to us. In addition, being an open access provider, another thing that's in our DNA is by pushing the conversation of what, what we can enable the business and the markets to do. So one of the um, proposals we have um, out to the regulators, for example, in the United Kingdom is, by going NG Pond 2, we have channels as well that a mobile operator could possibly leverage for their own service over the top and put their own active platform into the framework of our ODN and enable their own services. And again, we're not precious about it because it's about enabling the best innovation in the market, leveraging that fiber plant. So that wraps up the way that we are both defining how we build a fiber network, how we bring the mobile operators onto that fiber network and how we look at their current um, uh, evolutions, and as well as how we provide access services. Access services. And, and the key element for me, the key takeaway is, this is, a, this is a, often a best guess at this point in time. The market is still very immature for small cell densification, and we're gonna to have to place some bets. And we're fine with doing that because we're a long-term infrastructure uh, entity. And some of those will come to pass. But quite frankly, at the moment, until the mobile operators really converge on consistent architectures, and we start getting scale through, we all have to be in a position that we have to be highly flexible. And hopefully we're bringing that to the UK market. Thank you.